The conflict and the structural functional perspectives are classical sociological perspectives. What does that mean? It means that these are old. Um, they have their roots in the 1800s, and they are pretty much European in origin. They existed for about 150 years, and after 150 years, uh, around 1950, they both started to decline in a major way in popularity. American sociology sort of took over at that point, and Americans started to develop their own sociological perspectives after the 1950s. Right now, we're going to learn about the perspectives that developed from 1800 to 1950. Both of these perspectives are macro level. The Europeans like to think in terms of big picture. The Americans, after the 1950s, developed micro level perspectives of sociology. So that sort of mirrors the American um, emphasis on the individual and choice and agency. The Europeans were big fans of macro level and ideas like determinism. So let's turn to the first one, the structural functional perspective. We have two fathers of structural functionalism. The guy on the left, if you look at his picture, Emile Durkheim, he's a Frenchman. The guy on the right is named um, Talcott Parsons. So let's start with the assumptions of the structural functional approach. And they argue that there is a real essence of society. This essence is three things, stability, harmony, and evolution. Stability means that social patterns contribute to stability. Society is maintained. Most sociologists would agree that there's lots of patterns in society. Some would not agree that they're all stable and society is maintained. This group of sociologists, the structural functionalists, say that it's all about stability it's, and it's all about maintenance of society. Next one, harmony. The parts of society work together in harmony for the good of the whole. The good of the whole is important. Things might not seem harmonious, but they need to be harmonious for the whole. Maybe your life is bad, but is it good for the, the, the society as a whole? That's one of the criteria um, that functionalists use to evaluate society, and it's one of their assumptions about society. Everything works together, and it works together for the, for the good of the whole. Evolution. Social structure and culture adapt to new needs and demands. If something is dysfunctional for society, it will be eliminated. These people take an extremely optimistic view of society. Society wants stability. People want stability. Society needs to be harmonious. People want to live in a harmonious balance with their life. And if something's bad, we get rid of it. If something's good, we adapt it. Very, very optimistic view. I've created this little picture here for you. I like to represent the assumptions uh, visually. I'm very visual, if you can't tell. So I drew this picture. It looks like it's a whole bunch of circles. They're overlapping, and they're going in an upward movement. The upward movement of circles symbolizes progress and evolution. Bad things are left behind. The good continues. So things like having a job, that's good. It's good for society as a whole. So we continue to have jobs. In the past, we had jobs. In the future, we're going to have jobs. Jobs are good. If jobs become bad, we'll stop having jobs. The circles symbolize society in this picture. The circles um, is a symbol of stability and harmony for me. When I think of a circle, I think life is stable, life is harmonious. The circle signifies integration, the, the fact that society has boundaries, boundaries are good. The circle is a symbol of community and togetherness. Society is pulling together, we're working together, um, we, we um, complement each other. That's how they view the world. New circles are created indicating evolution. They overlap because things aren't created new every minute. The old society is continuously being maintained. Society stays the same. It's very stable. When it changes, it changes a little bit, and that's why we have overlap. So one way of thinking about this is that the functional approach thinks of society as an organism. A lot of sociologists teach this way of thinking about it. If you want to understand the functional approach, think about the society as a whole as a living organism. If someone loses their sight, they develop a very good sense of feeling, of smelling, of hearing. They heighten their awarenesses because there's a weakness elsewhere. If your human body loses your vision, if you, um, let's say you hurt your arm, well your other arm will have to start doing more work so that other arm will become stronger. The idea here is that our body is working for the good of the whole. My liver works and it helps my heart, my heart helps my brain, my brain helps my fingers. They're all working together for the good of the whole. 
And let's say I get sick. Well, my body will help repair itself and go back towards the stability of health, the equilibrium of feeling good. So a, a great way of thinking about structural functionalism is to think about it as an organism. Everything works together for the good of the, good of the whole. If your body does have a problem, your body seeks to go back towards balance, back towards harmony. And if something's good, your body should want to maintain it. Your dopamine receptor should give you, you know, pleasure for doing something that's good for your body. And when you're doing things that are negative, your body should give you feedback that those things are negative and you should, in theory, stop doing them. Same thing about society. For a lot of these scholars, human nature is the problem. They see humans as selfish and as motivated to take care of themselves. And the structural functionalists say, well, what keeps people from destroying themselves is society. Society makes us good. When I think about this in terms of my life, I have a three-year-old little boy. When he was one, he would occasionally try to smack me in the face. And I had to explain to him that that was unacceptable. Children are like little barbarians. I want it now! Give it to me! And family teaches them to sort of realize that other people's feelings matter. They can't always get what they want. Society, through family, teaches them how to be acceptable human beings. So for these folks, our churches, our families, our schools, our government, they're all helping us from destroying ourselves. Again, I'm trying to teach you to think of these perspectives as literary genres. So, you know, what are the assumptions of comedy? What are the assumptions of drama? What are the assumptions of romance? Well, I just told you the assumptions of structural functionalism. That's how they view the world, right? Those assumptions lead them to ask certain types of questions. This should flow logically. What are the social structures involved? What patterns exist? Well, first thing they want to do is gather information. If they're looking at domestic violence, if they're looking at divorce, if they're looking at drug abuse, they want to know, they want to gather information and say, what are the social structures? What are the patterns? What are the cultural meanings involved? Then they ask the question, what are the consequences of these social structures? What are the consequences of these cultural meanings? And then the final question is, do the social structures and cultures contribute to social stability and harmony? So if they're looking at something like drug abuse, they're going to say, well, what are the social structures involved? Well, we're talking about friendship networks. You're talking about maybe somebody who's addicted to drugs might have friends, those are social structures, that use drugs. Okay? Well, what are the cultural meanings involved? How do they interpret drug use? What does drugs mean to them? What do the friendships mean to them? What do non-drug users mean to them? How do they view the government? How do they view laws? Those things are all cultural meanings. Okay? So then they're going to ask, what are the consequences of having many friends who use drugs? What are the consequences of viewing laws this way? What are the consequences of viewing the drug the particular way they do? Last, they'd ask the question, well, when all of your friends use drugs, and you perceive drugs a certain way, and you perceive the government a certain way, and you perceive your family a certain way. Is that contributing to social stability or instability? That's how you use the sociological tools. You ask the questions, you try to find out the answers, even if you're just thinking through the answers, and you come to a conclusion. There are a few more tools that the functionalists used. The first one is called a manifest function. These are the recognized and intended consequences. So let me give you a bunch of examples. The manifest function of the school system is to educate you. The manifest function of the police force is to keep us safe and enforce the laws. It, what I'm basically saying here is the manifest function is what everyone thinks these things are supposed to do. A latent function is much more difficult. It's the unrecognized and unintended consequences. Well, what does that mean? What this, what this tool is saying is we have institutions, we have all sorts of things that have unrecognized and unintended consequences. So let me give you an example. Well, we said the, the manifest function of education was to educate our children. A latent function of education is that schools provide daycare for children, which allows mothers and fathers to work. It's a function of the education system.
If your kids go to public schools, you can drop them off at 7, 8 o'clock in the morning, pick them up at 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and during those hours, a parent can work. It's an unrecognized and unintended consequence. When the government dictated that we will have mandatory public education, the government didn't say, oh, this will allow women to start working. That wasn't their intention. But there was an unintended consequence of creating mandatory public education. And sociologists love these things, and they always want to bring people's attention to the fact that when you do something, when you create something, when you create a group, when you create a law, when you create uh, a new cultural meaning, there might be unrecognized and unintended consequences eh, or functions of that thing. And this is really good stuff if you can master it. I find it difficult, to be honest. Two other tools that we're going to see, functions and dysfunctions. Rather simple tool. Um, the functionalist approach will look at something and say, well, is that functional or is that dysfunctional? Um, I'm not going to go into too much depth here. My next uh, little tool here is called an institution. We're talking about things like schools, government, family, religion. <clears throat> According to the functional approach, institutions meet basic human need. We need to educate our kids, so we create an institution, school. We need um, an ability to make decisions as a, as a government, as a, as a group of people, as a large group of people. We create government. We need somebody to help our children learn right from wrong and take care of children. We create the institution of family. Humans need understandings about the divine and why we're here and all sorts of things like that. There's a human institution met. It's called religion. So for functionalists, institutions are great things. They give us what we need. They also say that institutions provide routine patterns for dealing with predictable problems. What does all that mean? So there's lots of institutions out there, and the school system sort of, you know, we need to create a school. Well, how do you create a school? Okay, you need an administrator. You need teachers. You need students. You need support staff. Um, if you were going to create a school, you wouldn't create it from nothing. You'd find another school and say, how did they solve this problem? If you're an intelligent student, you're probably saying, well, yeah, well, but there's no innovation. That's true. Every time you try to create something, let's say you're trying to create a new family, create a new school, create a new religion, when you look at other institutions, other churches, other families, other schools, you tend to do what's already been done. And some people find a lot of um, ease in that. They find it easy. You know, I'm going to create a new school. Well, how do you create a school? Well, let's look at other schools, and it makes the job easier. Other people say, well, it stifles creativity. But the functionalists, they generally say, this is good. Institutions give us what we need, and institutions provide routine patterns for dealing with problems. The last concept of this lecture that we're going to talk about right now is one of my favorite concepts. It's called institutional interdependence. And it's the idea that the norms and values of one institution are compatible with those in other institutions. So what's going on here? If our schools value hard work, our families value hard work, and our jobs value hard work, all those different institutions are valuing hard work. Our society will value hard work. That's important. If I let people come to my class late, and other teachers let their students come to class late, and then your family lets you show up to family events late, then you go to work, and you think, Oh, I can show up to work late. I show up everywhere else late. And your job fires you. <laughs> that doesn't work. It's good when all institutions are holding similar values and similar norms. And for the most part, they do. Your job wants you to be there on time. Your teacher wants you to be there on time. Your family and friends want you to be there on time. And if you get arrested, the judge wants you to be there on time. That's creating stability and harmony in our society. There's also another caveat here that we can think about. What if some of our institutions started to change? What if one institution started saying, well, you know what, we value competitiveness and we're really not going to value cooperation. That can have a ripple effect in our society. If all of our institutions are working together to create stability and harmony, as institu one institution starts changing, it might have a ripple effect on the other. For the most part, society tries to keep the same values and norms, things like hard work, punctuality, honesty, all those values are shared across institutions, and we have a great deal of stability, according to the functionalists.